Reagan would have been appalled by that infomercial last night. He tried to portray a failed, desperate, depressed people and nation incapable of doing what Americans have always done, and that is succeed like no other people on the face of the earth. It gave a dreary, depressing image of this country. It was shameful. And the purpose of that commercial was not to promote America or Americans. It was to promote Barack Obama. Reagan put country first. Obama puts Obama first. But I thought that we would produce our own Obama infomercial by putting his own words together. This is the real Barack Obama infomercial. There's a lot of change going on outside of the court um, that you know the, the judges have to essentially take judicial notice of. I mean, you've got World War II, you've got uh, 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 the doctrines of Nazism that that we are fighting against that start looking uncomfortably similar to what's going on uh, back here at home. I think we can say that. Uh, uh, the Constitution reflected a enormous blind spot in this culture that carries on until this day, and, and, uh, and that the framers uh, had that same blind spot. I, I, I don't think the two views are contradictory to say that it was a remarkable political document uh, that paved the way for where we are now, and to say that uh, it also uh, re- reflected the fundamental flaw of this country that continues to this day. You know, if, if, if you look at... Um, the, the, the victories and failures of the civil rights movement um, and its litigation strategy in the court. I think where it succeeded was to vest formal rights uh, in uh, previously dispossessed peoples so that uh, I would now have the right to vote. I would now be able to sit at a lunch counter and, and order, and as long as I could pay for it, I'd be okay. Uh, but the Supreme Court never ventured into the issues of redistribution of wealth uh, and sort of more basic issues of political and, and, and uh, economic justice in the society. And uh, uh, to that extent, as radical as I think people try to characterize the Warren Court, uh, it wasn't that radical. It, it didn't break free from the essential constraints that were placed uh, uh, by the Founding Fathers in the Constitution, at least as it's been interpreted, and Warren Court interpreted it in the same way that that generally the Constitution is a charter of negative liberties, says what the states can't do to you, says what the federal government can't do to you, but it doesn't say what the federal government or the state government must do on your behalf. Uh, and that hasn't shifted. And one of the, uh, I think, uh, the tragedies of the civil rights movement was um, because the civil rights movement became so court-focused, uh, I think that there was a tendency to lose track of the political and community organizing and, and activities on the ground that are able to put together the actual coalitions of power through which you bring about redistributive uh, change. Uh, and uh, in some ways, we still suffer from that. The gentleman made the point that the Warren Court wasn't uh, terribly radical. My question is, um, with economic changes, my question is, is it too late for that kind of reparative work economically? And is that the appropriate place for reparative economic work to take place. You mean the court? The courts, or would it be legislation at this point? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, maybe I'm, I'm showing my bias here as a, as a legislator as well as a law professor, but uh, you know, I'm not optimistic about bringing about uh, major uh, redistributive uh, uh, change uh, through the courts. Um, you know, the institution just isn't structured that way. You, know, you, you just look at very rare examples where in, during the desegregation era, the court was willing to, for example, order, uh, uh, you know, changes that cost money to a local school district. And the court was very uncomfortable with it. It was hard to manage. It was hard to figure out. Uh, you start getting into all sorts of uh, separation of powers issues, and, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the court monitoring or, or engaging in a process uh, that essentially is administrative. Uh, don't worry, he'll and, and fix that with a, two a appointments to the court. You know, I, the, the court's just not very good at it, and politically it's just it's very hard to legitimize opinions from the uh, from the court in that regard. So, I mean, I think that uh, although you can craft theoretical justifications for it legally, um, you know, I think you can, uh, any, any three of us sitting here could, could come up with 
uh, a, a rationale for bringing about economic change through the courts. We cannot continue to rely only on our military in order to achieve the national security objectives that we've set. We've got to have a civilian national security force that's just as powerful, just as strong, just as well funded. Your new tax plan is going to tax me more, isn't it? It's not that I want to punish your success. I just want to make sure that everybody who is behind you, that they've got a chance at success, too. I think when you spread the wealth around, it's good for it. Beyond a loyalty to America's ideals, beyond a willingness to dissent on behalf of those ideals, I also believe that patriotism must, if it is to mean anything, involve the willingness to sacrifice, to give up something we value on behalf of a larger cause. Now, I won't pretend that any of this is going to be easy. It won't be. It's going to be hard. I don't pretend that this is not going to come with a cost. There are going to be costs. We all need to sacrifice. We're all going to need to put our weight behind these changes, because now more than ever, we're all in this together. What this crisis has taught us is at the end of the day, there's no real separation between Main Street and Wall Street. There's only the road we're traveling on as Americans. And we will rise or fall on that journey as one nation, as one people. And, and that's why I think it's important for the president to set a tone that says all of us are going to contribute, all of us are going to make sacrifices, and it means that, yes, we may have to cut some spending, although I disagree with Senator McCain about an across-the-board freeze. I knew that the American people were decent and generous, willing to work hard and sacrifice for future generations. No one's forcing you to care. You can take your diploma, walk off this stage, and chase only after the big house and the nice suits and the other things that our money culture says you should buy. You can choose to narrow your concerns and live life in a way that tries to keep your story separate from America's. But I hope you don't. Not because you have an obligation to those who are less fortunate, although I believe you do have that obligation. Not because you have a debt to all those who helped you get to where you are today, although I do believe you have that debt to pay. It's because you have an obligation to yourself. Because our individual salvation depends on collective salvation. Because thinking only about yourself, fulfilling your immediate wants and needs, betrays a poverty of ambition. Because it's only when you hitch your wagon to something larger than yourself that you realize your true potential and discover the role that you'll play in writing the next great chapter in the American story. And that's why I won't just ask for your vote as a candidate. I will ask for your service and your active citizenship when I'm President of the United States. This won't be a call issued in one speech or one program. I want this to be a central cause of my presidency. We will ask Americans to serve. We will create new opportunities for Americans to serve. And we will direct that service to our most pressing national challenges. But the burdens of global citizenship continue to bind us together. A change of leadership in Washington will not lift this burden. In this new century, Americans and Europeans alike will be required to do more, not less. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he's not talking about service in the military. He's not talking about the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. He's not talking about charitable service. He's not talking about joining the police force or becoming a firefighter, an FBI agent. He's not talking about any of that. When he says in service to the country, he's speaking as a socialist. He means you will be required to do something to contribute to his vision. To his vision. When he talks about sacrifice, what he's talking about is taking money from you, all of you, and giving it to the 33 to 40 percent of the people out there who don't pay any federal income taxes. He's talking about socialism. That's what he means by sacrifice. That's what they do. They twist their words.